everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly and I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about a solved serial killer case, a serial killer who was given the nickname the Route 40 killer. In the late 1980s, several young women would just suddenly disappear and strangely they all had one thing in common. They vanished, they were last seen alongside the Route 40 highway in Delaware. One by one their dead bodies were discovered and it soon became clear to the police that they had been the victims of a sadistic serial killer. A serial killer who clearly was not going to stop until the day that he was caught. But quickly before we get into to the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Anna Luisa for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Anna Luisa is a sustainable jewellery brand that I've worked with a couple of times on my channel before. I've been buying from them for years now because honestly they just make the most beautiful high quality jewellery pieces that in my opinion are very fairly priced and I am partnering with them today to tell you guys about their Valentine's Day sale. Valentine's Day is obviously fast approaching and they have an incredible offer right now where if you buy one, you get one for half price. So if you buy two jewellery pieces, you'll get a 50% discount off the second piece. So if you are currently looking for a gift for your partner this Valentine's Day, then why not check out Ana Luisa? They have so many different designs and pieces to choose from. They have countless necklace designs and earring designs, rings, bracelets. And if, like me, you do not have a significant other this year, then now is the time to spoil yourself. I think it's really important every day, but especially on days like Valentine's Day, to practice self-love and treat yourself as much as you would treat a partner. Let's take some advice from Miley Cyrus and buy our own jewellery, just like we can buy our own flowers. If you know, you know. I recently treated myself to some gorgeous, gorgeous pieces from Ana Luisa. I got this adorable little butterfly necklace and also their earrings to match. I got this little necklace which is kind of like a moon shape. This is called the May necklace. And I also got this other necklace which I'm wearing right now. Can you tell that I really like necklaces? And this is called the Earth Pendant. I think this is one of my favourite pieces I've ever had from Ana Luisa and that is saying something because let me tell you, I've got a big collection. Ana Luisa offers international shipping. They actually offer free shipping and free returns to those of you in the US. All of their products are backed by a 360 65 day warranty and as I said before they are a sustainable brand. They are carbon neutral and climate neutral certified and any of their jewellery that they don't sell gets donated. So if you would like to check out their Valentine's Day sale and take advantage of that incredible buy one get one half price offer then head to the link at the top line of the description box. And if you are watching this video after Valentine's Day then don't worry you can still get 20% off of your order when you use the discount code MOLLY. 20. Again, a huge thank you to Ana Luisa for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to you guys for always supporting the sponsors on this channel. And now let's just get into the case. Just before we continue, please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murders of several young women and it involves heavy themes such as violence towards women, torture, sexual assault and mutilation. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back to the 80s, to the late 80s in Delaware, which is obviously a state in the US. The date was the 29th of November 1987 and that evening at around 9.30pm a young couple were out driving in Newark, which is a city located in northern Delaware. The couple were just driving around looking for a quiet place to park up until eventually they pulled into a construction site or an industrial park called the Old Baltimore Pike Industrial Park, which was located just off of Route 40 and as they pulled in the couple spotted something on the ground on the side of the road. 
image. At first it appeared to be like a dummy or a mannequin or something, however as they got closer they realised that that in fact wasn't the case. What they had actually found was a dead body. The dead body of a young woman. So very very panicked, the couple immediately contacted emergency services and very quickly police were at the scene. And upon first glance it was clear that this woman, whoever she was, she did not die a natural death. It was clear that this was probably a homicide. She was partially clothed when she was found. Her blue pants had been pulled down and her breasts were exposed. Her bra had actually been cut in the middle so that her breasts would be exposed. So instantly it's looking pretty likely that this crime was sexually motivated. She had injuries all over her body. It looked as though she had been beaten. She had blood coming from the back of her head where she had been hit in the head repeatedly with some kind of heavy blunt object. She had duct tape in her hair from where it's believed she had previously been gagged around the mouth. It appeared as though she had previously been bound. She had marks on her wrists and ankles from where she had been tied up. There was evidence of strangulation as she had a ligature or a ligature mark around her neck and I believe this paired with you know the blows to her head were ultimately this woman's cause of death. And the medical examiner later determined in her autopsy that the object used to hit this woman in the head was probably a hammer. But that wasn't all her autopsy revealed. It was concluded that not only had this woman been brutally murdered, but she was also tortured, viciously tortured before her death too. Her breast had just been mutilated by the perpetrator and it's believed that they used some kind of tool, like work tools to do this. They possibly used something like a plier to mutilate her breast and just cause her so much pain. And of course the mutilation of her breasts again suggest a sexual motive to the crime. However, having said that, there were no signs of rape. This woman hadn't been raped by her attacker, which seems to suggest that this killer got enough sexual gratification from the torture aspect of this crime. He didn't feel the need to rape her. Torturing her is what did it for him. A really, really horrendous murder. What this woman went through in her final moments was just pure evil. And after finding her body, the very first thing that the police needed to do was find out her name, determine her identity, and then hopefully from there they can work out who did this to her. So the victim's fingerprints were taken and they were compared to fingerprints that the police had in their databases. However, they never found a match. This woman was not on the system. So identifying her was going to be a little bit tricky. But one thing that they thought could be helpful in this identifying process was her tattoos. She had quite a few unique distinctive tattoos on her body. So the detectives took some pictures of them and I think initially began just showing these pictures to their colleagues, the other police officers in the department. And it was through this that the victim was identified. I think maybe one of the officers recognised the tattoos and said that they believed the victim was a young woman named Shirley Ellis. And eventually this was confirmed. The victim was in fact Shirley. So just for a bit of background information about her, Shirley Ellis was 23 years old at the time that this case took place. Her mother was called Nancy and her sister was called Nancy too. Clearly she had been named after her mum. I couldn't find any other information online about other family members that Shirley may have had but she was described by her mum and her sister as just being such a kind person. Her sister said that she would do anything anything for anyone. She would always be there for anyone that needed help. And this was probably partly because she herself knew what it was like to go through a rough patch. She had had her fair share of hard times. Apparently a couple of years before this case took place, Shirley went through some things. She had some struggles and she started running away from home a lot. And during the times when she was away from home, obviously she needed to earn money to buy food and things. And so Shirley decided to turn to sex work. She became a sex worker, which understandably terrified her family. They were so scared for her. They hated the thought of her being out on the street so late at night, being picked up by men, by strangers, being in that vulnerable situation. And so I think a few years later, they were so happy when Shirley decided that that kind of lifestyle wasn't really for her anymore. She decided that she wanted to have a fresh start, basically. And so she actually started her studies to become a nurse. She decided 
that that was what she wanted to do with her life. That was the career path that she wanted to go down. However, it was a career that Shirley would never really get to see because, as we know, in late November of 1987, she was brutally murdered and her dead body was found. It was established that she was actually killed on the same day that her body was discovered, the 29th of November 1987. The police found out from her loved ones that that evening, around 6pm, Shirley left her home in Newark with the intention of going to a hospital in Wilmington in Delaware. Wilmington is about 13 to 14 miles away from Newark and she planned to go there to the hospital to take some leftover Thanksgiving food to a patient, I believe an AIDS patient that she had become friends with. It had obviously been Thanksgiving a few days before this and she wanted them to have some of the nice Thanksgiving food. So it's believed that she started walking along Route 40 towards the hospital and that she probably started hitchhiking. She would stand on the side of the road and thumb for a lift hoping that a car would stop and drive her to her destination. This was apparently something that Shirley did often. She would often hitchhike and it had always been fine so clearly she didn't think that she was putting herself in any kind of danger by doing this. But it seems as though this particular night she was wrong. You see, when the police found out that she had hitchhiked that evening, they immediately theorised that she may have been picked up by whoever killed her. They probably saw her on the highway, on the side of the road, pulled over, offered her a ride, but in actual fact, that wasn't their intention. They never intended to drop her at the hospital. They intended to torture and kill her. And that's exactly what they did before dumping her body on the side of the road in that industrial park later that night. Just as a side note, it was determined that she was not killed at the location where her body was found. Shirley was murdered elsewhere and then the killer got rid of her body. So perhaps if she was picked up that night, she was killed in the murderer's vehicle. So following the discovery of Shirley's body, the search immediately began for her killer. I'm sure the police would have looked into her background they would have looked into the people that knew her, the men in her life, to determine whether or not they could have been responsible. And they also appealed to the public. They pleaded for anyone with any information about the murder of Shirley Ellis to get in touch. But unfortunately, any tips and leads they did receive ultimately just went nowhere. It was just dead end after dead end. And slowly, over time, the case of Shirley Ellis just started to go cold. The police were really struggling to identify the sadistic individual that did this to her. But then, in June of the following year, June of 1988, so about seven months after Shirley's murder, a new potential lead or development emerged in the case when the body of a second young woman was found. It was the morning of the 29th of June when a couple of workers turned up at their job, at their workplace, which was a construction site in Delaware, where, according to one source, an apartment complex was being built at the time. They arrived at the construction site, which was, again, just like the first crime scene, located just off of Route 40, and there they discovered the dead body of a female on the ground. When police were called to the scene, they observed that there were tyre marks on the ground right next to the body, which suggested that this was not the location where she died. It indicated that she died elsewhere and she was dumped at this construction site. She was naked, though it was determined that she hadn't been raped but she had injuries all over her body. It was clear that she had been bound by her wrists and ankles. She'd been strangled with a ligature. She had blunt force trauma injuries to her head where she had been hit and beaten around the head and in addition to that her breasts had been mutilated with some kind of tool. In fact her breasts had been mutilated so badly that I believe one if not both of her nipples had actually been partially removed moved. It's all sounding incredibly familiar, isn't it? This second woman had a hell of a lot of the same injuries that Shirley Ellis had sustained. They'd both been strangled, both hit around the head, both bound, both been tortured, both their breasts had been mutilated. And as well as that, Shirley Ellis's body was found in an area which was only about three miles away from where this second body had been found. So of course it did not take the police long to put the pieces together here and realise that these two cases 
were probably connected, that both Shirley Ellis and this second woman were murdered by the same man. And so after coming to this realisation, the detectives working on the case of this second woman got in touch with the detectives working on the Shirley Ellis case, and this became almost like a joint investigation. Eventually, it was determined through dental records that the second murder victim was a young woman named Catherine DeMaro. Catherine was 31 years old at the time of her murder. She she was a mum, she had two children, and she was a single mum, she had previously gotten divorced, and some sources state that she was a sex worker. And after speaking to friends and family of Catherine's, the police discovered that she would often enjoy going out to like different bars and establishments that were along the Route 40 highway in Delaware, and she was also known to hitchhike along Route 40. If she needed to get somewhere, she would often thumb for a lift, which was a another similarity to the Shirley Ellis case. In fact, the last time that Catherine was seen alive was just the evening before her body was found at around 11.30pm on the 28th of June, and at the time she was on her own walking along Route 40, looking for a lift. So again, it seemed incredibly likely that her killer was someone who stopped and picked her up that night, and she was probably killed inside the killer's vehicle. And during Catherine's autopsy, experts were able to obtain some evidence which they thought might have actually come from the killer's vehicle. You see, on her body, they noticed a load of tiny, tiny little blue polyester fibres, which when examined more closely, were determined to have come from some kind of blue carpet. So it was theorised then that perhaps these blue fibres had come from the killer's vehicle, the carpet in the killer's car. So this was interesting evidence to have, potentially very promising evidence, because who knows, later on down the line they could possibly use these fibres to either rule in or rule out any suspect. Now it was following the discovery of Catherine DeMaro's body when the FBI became involved with this whole case and a profile of the killer was created. FBI experts theorised the type of male that they believed they were looking for. And they theorised that the killer was a white man. He was probably quite young, believed to be aged anywhere between 25 to 35, and that he may have had a job in, like, building and construction, as that's where the two victims' bodies had been left. They'd both been left on a construction site. But to be honest, they may have had really any job where tools, building tools, were involved, because if you recall, both women had been hit around the head with what the police believed was a hammer and their breasts had been mutilated with pliers. And another thing that the FBI predicted was that this was only the beginning for this killer. They believed that this was a man who would not stop until he was caught. They believed that this was the start of a serial killer in Delaware. The only serial killer that I believe the state of Delaware had ever seen. Now it was clear from both murders, the murder of Shirley Ellis and Catherine DeMaro, that this killer was basically using the Route 40 highway to find his victims because they were both picked up along Route 40 whilst they were hitchhiking and their bodies were found in different areas just off of Route 40. So clearly this was the killer's hunting ground, so to speak. This is where he would go to find victims that he could abduct and kill. And so with this theory in mind, the police hatched a plan. They decided to bring in a young female police officer named Renee Tashner and she was going to go undercover for them. They basically wanted Rene to go out at night in normal clothes. She was going to walk along Route 40, I think look as though she was thumbing for a lift, and just see who would stop for her. And if a car did stop, she was to engage in conversation with the male drivers, you know, try to find out a bit about them, whether they came to this area often, what they were doing that night, what they were looking for, because apparently at this time in the 80s, Route 40 was known as being a place for sex workers to kind of operate. They would stand on the side of the road waiting to be approached by men, by clients. So the police believed that the killer was coming to this area because he thought that it would be easier to find women to abduct, women that would be more likely to get into his car willingly because that was part of 
of their job. So yeah, they wanted Rene to stand on the side of the road, wait for men to stop, and just talk to them by their vehicle and see what kind of information she could get from them. And of course, other undercover officers would be listening and waiting nearby because obviously this could be an incredibly dangerous situation for Rene to be in. If the killer did stop, then there was every chance that they could make an attempt on her life. They could threaten her, try to abduct her if they sensed that she wasn't going to get into the car. So officers were nearby ready to jump in if they ever needed to. And at the same time, they were listening to the conversations that Rene was having with these men through like a wire, a secret recording device, just in case any man in particular stood out and piqued their interest. This whole undercover operation with Rene began in the summer of 1988, just the month after Catherine DeMauro's body was found. And many, many men did pull over alongside her, most of which were looking for a sex worker that they could sleep with, as the police thought. And if the men fit the description of the profile that the FBI had come up with, you know, white between 25 to 35, etc., then the detectives would take their vehicle's registration and look a little bit more into them. They would conduct background checks and things like that. However, this operation continued for weeks and it didn't seem to be really going anywhere. The majority of the men were eliminated from the murder inquiry. And then, just the month after the undercover operation began, in August of 1988, it seemed as though this serial killer may have struck again. He may have already claimed his third victim. You see, on the 22nd of August 1988, a 27-year-old woman named Margaret Lynn Finner just suddenly disappeared. Margaret was described as being very close with her family. She was actually a mother. She had children. However, her friends would inform the police that in the lead up to her disappearance, she was really, really struggling to make ends meet. She was struggling to provide for her kids. And so to make extra money, she had started sex work. And this is something that I don't think her family were aware of. Margaret hadn't told them that this was what she was doing to help pay the bills. And as it turns out, that was her plan on the night that she vanished. She went to Route 40 to try and find clients and she never returned home. And soon after, her loved ones reported her as missing. And because of the similarities between Margaret's disappearance and the first two victims, Shirley and Catherine, the police feared that perhaps she too had been the victim of foul play, that she had been murdered by the same man, the serial killer that they were looking for. So an investigation into the disappearance of Margaret Lynn Finner began and it wasn't long before the police had their first lead. You see, whilst they were taking statements from her friends, the detectives were informed by one friend in particular that on the night that Margaret went missing, he saw her getting into the passenger seat of a blue Ford van and the friend said that the driver of the van was a white male and that was the last confirmed sighting of Margaret Lynn Finner. She was not seen again after this. So that was another thing that the police knew to be on the lookout for. It seemed likely that the murderer drove a blue van. That potentially narrowed down their suspect list a little bit because the police now had an idea of what kind of vehicle the killer may have had and not long after this lead, after the disappearance of Margaret Lynn Finner, a blue van stopped alongside the undercover female officer, Renee Tashna. She was still out most nights working on this undercover operation. And one evening, as she was standing alone along Route 40, as I just said, a blue van pulled up next to her. So immediately, the detectives nearby were on high alert. Once the blue van stopped, the driver of the vehicle, which was a man, started chatting to Renee, and he made it clear quite quickly that he was interested in having sex with her. He was looking for a sex worker that night. And as Renee continued speaking to him, she peered into his van and something immediately stood out to her. She noticed that he had blue carpet in his van. And if you recall from earlier, the second victim, Catherine DeMauro, had blue carpet fibres 
all over her body when she was found. So this individual instantly became a top suspect for the police and after Rene finished her conversation with him and he drove away, they started looking into him a bit more. They tracked his license plate and discovered that this man was married. He had a wife and he and his wife had children together and yet he was going out at night looking for sex workers. He worked as a school teacher and I think he lived fairly locally and because the police knew that he had blue carpet, blue interior in his van, that meant that they were able to obtain a search warrant so that they could conduct a search of his property, his home and his actual van. They took a couple of fibres from the blue carpet in his van and they were sent off to the lab to be compared against the fibres found on Catherine DeMaro's body and in the meantime Time, they also searched his house and in his attic police discovered kind of like a collection of items which suggested that this man was into BDSM. They found items that could be used to tie someone up and restrain them, they found a lot of sex toys and things like that. Now of course being into BDSM does not mean you are a murderer but given the fact that Shirley Ellis and Catherine DeMaro's breasts had both been mutilated, that suggested that the killer got sexual gratification out of causing physical pain to his victims. It was the torture element of the crime that motivated him in a sexual way. So the fact that this man, this school teacher, was into BDSM, that made the police think that maybe that was a potential connection to the murders, but obviously that is not concrete evidence. That in itself is not enough to prove that he was the killer. It's barely even circumstantial evidence, so they couldn't arrest him. And actually, eventually the police were able to rule him out as a suspect entirely because X experts were able to determine that the blue carpet in his van was not a match to the blue fibres collected from Catherine DeMaro's body. This man was innocent. He was not the killer that the police were looking for. So again, the police had reached a dead end and they were really struggling to find this serial killer, which was really worrying because as I'm sure you can imagine, time is of the essence in a case like this. As I said before, if this killer wasn't apprehended quickly, then it was extremely extremely, extremely likely that he was going to kill again. He was going to keep killing until the day that he was physically stopped, until he was caught. So the police knew that they had to act fast. They had to find this highly, highly dangerous evil man. They had to find the Route 40 killer, as he was soon dubbed by the media. So in an attempt to identify him, the police were still appealing to the public, asking for anyone with any information to come forward. They made it public that this was looking like a serial killer operation. They knew that it was important to warn the community, warn young women in particular, because clearly they were the targets of this offender. And as well as doing that, the undercover operation with Rene was still ongoing. She was still out walking along Route 40 most nights, just waiting to see which cars would stop. And on the evening of the 14th of September, 1988, the police had another lead to follow up on when another blue coloured van pulled up alongside her and the driver was a young white male. Well, I say this blue van pulled up alongside her, but actually it didn't straight away. Rene and the team nearby noticed that for quite a while it was circling Rene. It would drive close to her and then drive away and then turn around and drive back towards her. Rene actually said during a documentary that I watched that it felt like she was she was almost being circled by a shark. You know how sharks tend to circle their prey before they attack? That is what it felt like for Rene when this blue van was going around her in circles. The driver would just drive around and around and the whole time he would stare at Rene. Eventually, this blue van actually stopped and pulled up alongside Rene and the driver started chatting to her. He said that his name was Jim and when Rene asked him what he did for work, Jim said that he was an electrician. This instantly stood out to the police because an electrician would have tools. They would carry the kind of tools that the victims in this case had been tortured and mutilated and killed with. And another thing that stood out to Rene immediately when she peered inside the van was that there was blue carpet 
all over it. He had kitted out his van with blue carpet. And so, as she was standing by the van speaking to Jim, Renee put her hands inside the vehicle and she started trying to subtly pluck some carpet fibres out so that she could give them to the detective. Renee continued chatting to the driver. Again, she was just standing by the side of his van talking to him through the passenger side window. And then all of a sudden, literally out of nowhere, the driver lunged forward to the window and he opened the passenger door. He was trying to persuade her to get in the vehicle. He was saying, get in, get in. He tried to pull her into the van, but Renee just shut the door on him and she said no. She made up a story that she had a headache from partying all day and that she was just going to go. She was going to walk home. And as she began walking away, the man drove off. But this interaction that Renee had really stuck with the police. This man stood out to them because, well, number one, he matched the description. He matched the offender profile that the FBI had provided. He was a young white man. He had a job where he was likely to carry around a tool bag. He had a blue van with blue carpet inside. But also just the way that he was with Renee, the fact that he was quite forceful when trying to get her to come into the van, that made alarm bells ring. So the police had another suspect and actually that night after he drove away after speaking to Rene, the undercover police team followed him, I guess just to see where he went next. Although I believe they ultimately just followed him to his home. So the detectives went back to the station and they began looking more into this man. And when they ran his license plate through the system, they found out that this man's name wasn't actually Jim. He had lied about that. He'd given a fake name. His real name was Stephen Pennell and he was in his early 30s by this point, by 1988. He apparently didn't have a criminal record and for the most part he seemed like a pretty normal guy. He had a house, he had a wife whom he had a couple of children with, but still the police were going to keep looking further into him and they decided to send off the blue fibres that Rene had had plucked from his van to the science lab to be compared against the fiber evidence that had previously been collected in the cave. And as they were waiting for those results, the serial killer investigation just continued. They were still looking into Stephen Pennell, but they also had other suspects and lines of inquiry that they were following up on. He was not the main focus of this inquiry. And unfortunately, less than a week after this, the detectives received a phone call a phone call that they had been dreading. They were informed that another dead body had been found. On the 20th of September 1988, the body of yet another young female was discovered on the side of a canal, on the rocks of the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal. She was naked and she had sustained many of the same kind of injuries as the previous victim. She had been bound, she had been beaten and tortured and mutilated. Her left nipple had been removed. The only difference was that she hadn't been strangled, I don't believe, and she also hadn't been hit around the head like the first two victims. In her autopsy, it was actually found that this woman was on drugs at the time of her death. She had cocaine in her system, and the medical examiner believed that the drugs made her heart incapable of withstanding the shock and excruciating pain of the torture that she was being subjected to. So while she was being tortured, her heart literally just stopped. The murderer never got round to the actual killing part of the crime because she died before that. Eventually this woman was identified through fingerprints as being 22 year old Michelle Gordon. She lived in the Newcastle area of Delaware and she was described by her brother Robert as being a very happy-go-lucky young woman. She was charming and charismatic and she was very kind. Robert said that she would literally give you her last bit of money if you needed it. Some sources state that Michelle worked as a sex worker and that she had an addiction to cocaine, which would obviously explain why cocaine was in her system at the time of her death. And she disappeared about four days before her body was found on the evening of the 16th of September. And apparently she was last seen while she was hitchhiking along Route 40. In fact, she was last seen getting into the passenger seat of a blue Ford van. So now that's three victims, three
three murder cases that the police had on their hands, possibly four, because Margaret Lynn Finner was still missing at this point. She had not been found. There was still no sign of her anywhere. So despite the media attention this case was getting, the killer was not stopping. He was not slowing down. If anything, he was speeding up. There was a lot less time between his second and third kill than his first and second. It was around this point in the investigation when a special task force was established. A lot more detectives and police officers were drafted in to work specifically on this case and follow up on different lines of inquiry and suspects. One of which was still Stephen Pennell, the guy in the blue van that stopped alongside Rene in September of 1988. I believe it was when the task force was set up when undercover officers were assigned to basically watch him all the time. He was pretty much under 24 hour surveillance because they just wanted to see what he did. I guess if he was the killer, they wanted to see if they could catch him in the act. And they noticed whilst they were watching him that pretty much every single night, in the middle of the night, he would leave his home, get into his blue van, and he would drive straight to Route 40. He would just drive along Route 40 for hours in the dead of night. Again, another thing that stood out to the police because clearly this is exactly the kind of thing that the Route 40 killer had been doing because all of his victims had disappeared along this highway. So more and more, Stephen Pennell is looking incredibly suspicious. But I mean, they still had no solid evidence against him, really. No evidence which directly connected him to the crime, so they couldn't arrest him. Or at least that was until the detectives heard back from the FBI lab that were examining the blue fibres taken by Rene from Stephen's van. You see, when they were compared against the fibres found on Catherine DeMauro's body, it was determined that they were a match. An exact match indicating that Catherine DeMauro had been inside his van on the night that she went missing and was murdered. It was looking like Stephen Pennell was, in fact, the Route 40 serial killer. Now, according to a couple of sources, not long after this huge development, on the 30th of September 1988, Pennell was actually pulled over whilst he was driving in his van for some kind of traffic violation. And I think due to this, the police had the warrant to be able to search the van. And when I tell you that they found a lot of evidence in there. I really mean it. A lot of damning, damning evidence. Evidence which, again, pointed to him as being the killer. They found a lot of duct tape and zip ties in there, which police believe he may have used to restrain his victims. They found tools such as pliers. They literally found what they believe to be his torture kit and this contained items like a whip and handcuffs, knives etc. But as well as that forensics also discovered some hair inside the van. In a sink in the van they found hair and they also found blood traces of blood on the walls and when tested this blood was later found to have come from the second victim. Catherine DeMauro. The blood was a match to Catherine. The hair in the sink was determined to be a match to Michelle Gordon. They found a fibre in his van which matched some of the clothing that the first victim, Shirley Ellis, had been wearing on the day that she vanished. The duct tape in the van matched the kind of duct tape that was found in Shirley's hair. The zip ties in the van matched the ligature marks that Shirley Ellis and Catherine DeMauro had on their necks. The pliers found in the van matched up with the injuries that each victim had sustained to their breast. They'd each been mutilated with this exact type of plier. There was a hell of a lot of evidence in Stephen's van, evidence which ultimately proved that he was the murderer. And the evidence did not even stop there. When they searched his home, they found even more. For example, in his shed, they found even more tools. They also discovered a videotape that Pennell owned. It was called Taming Rebecca. And when they watched it, they discovered that it was a BDSM pornography tape where a woman, I'm guessing named Rebecca, was tied up and she was being tortured by a man. In fact, in one part of the tape, the man was specifically targeting 
her breast, causing pain to her breast by sticking a pin into her nipple. And as we know, the victims in this case, their breasts were mutilated. That seems to be the main part of their body that the killer enjoyed inflicting pain on. So perhaps Stephen took inspiration from this videotape. Another thing that they noticed in his home, which wasn't, I guess, necessarily evidence, not solid evidence anyway, but they noticed that there were a load of holes in the walls, as if someone had gone around punching the walls. And so the detectives asked Pinal's wife, her name was Vera, where these holes had come from, and she said that they'd come from Stephen. When he would get angry and lose his temper, he would just punch the walls. So clearly he was a very aggressive man. In fact, let's press pause on the actual case for a second, and I will tell you a little bit more about Stephen Pinal, about his background. Stephen Brian Pinal was born on the 22nd of November, 19. 57 in Delaware. So he had lived in Delaware his whole life. I couldn't find the names of his parents anywhere online. I'm actually not sure if his father was ever in the picture, but his mum was, and he did not really have a very good relationship with her, especially when he was an adult, which is something that we'll talk about in a minute. But according to sources, Stephen seemed to be a pretty normal kid growing up. He could be quite quiet and shy at times, but he was described as being helpful. He would always give his neighbours a helping hand if they needed anything. In fact, in high school, he was literally known as being a gentle giant because he was very tall and he just seemed like a nice guy. I don't think anyone really had a bad thing to say about him. Throughout his childhood, it was said that Stephen Pennell always had an obsession and a fascination with the police force. He was so interested in police work. In fact, it was his dream to become a police officer when he was older. That was the career that he wanted. And after graduating high school in the mid to late 70s, he went to college and started studying criminology of all subjects. Following this, he applied to become a police officer. He applied to the Wilmington Police Cadet Program. However, he was rejected after he failed to pass the physical training test and thus his dream of joining the police force ended there. As a result of this, he started training to become an electrician and from what I can gather, it was around this same time, around this period of his life, when he met his wife Vera. They got married, they had a couple of kids together. I think they had two or three children. And as I've said a few times in this video, he really did seem like just a normal, nice family man. However, of course, no one can see what goes on behind closed doors. Whilst he was described as being a very good father to his kids, it's been reported that he could be physically abusive towards his wife. He and his wife would often argue, apparently because he ran up a lot of debts, a lot of credit card bills, because he never really brought in much money as an electrician. He could never hold down a job for very long. In fact, one source states that he also worked as a bouncer occasionally for some extra cash. But yeah, they would argue quite a lot. And these arguments reportedly led to him becoming violent. It's stated on one source that after one particular argument, Stephen actually broke his wife's arm. However, I don't believe she reported the assault to the police at the time. He also argued a hell of a lot with his mother. Like I mentioned, they didn't really have the best relationship because apparently when he and his wife had kids, she inserted herself a little bit too much. She would criticise how Stephen parented his own children. She would tell him that he was doing it wrong. In fact, according to a documentary that I watched, one comment that his mother made to him was something along the lines of, if you don't parent your kids better, then I'm gonna have to spank you and put you to bed. And this is a grown man that she is talking to. She was threatening to send her 30-year-old son to bed. So they would have had a lot of arguments. And it's been theorised by psychologists that Stephen's own mother may have actually been a part of why he would commit murder. Because for Stephen, and for most serial killers, it's about power. They love having power. They love having control over their victims. And with his mother, Stephen never had that. He always felt powerless because she criticised him a lot. And even as a grown man, she was always telling him what to do. So it's been theorised that he may have seen women. He may have seen his victims almost as like a representation of his mum. And he was 
taking the anger and the rage that he had towards his mum out on his victims. I do think that's definitely partly what motivated Stephen Pennell to kill, but I personally believe that for the most part these killings were sexually motivated. Even though he didn't rape his victims, he got sexual gratification from torturing them and mutilating one of the most feminine parts of their bodies, their breasts, just like in that videotape Taming Rebecca. But going back to where we were before in the case, after gathering all of the evidence that linked Stephen to the murders, the police finally moved moved in to arrest him. He was arrested in November of 1988 and taken to the police station to be questioned. However, he wouldn't say anything. He kept quiet, he denied the murders, and he requested a lawyer. So it was clear that this case was headed to trial. But before any court proceedings began, there was another development in the case because just the day after Pennell was arrested, detectives received the news that another body had been found. The severely decomposed remains of a female were found by deer hunters, I believe in a wooded area, not far from where Michelle Gordon's body was found. And these remains were basically skeletal. And so for that reason, I think it's Instantly, the police thought that these could be the remains of Margaret Lynn Finner, who by this point had been missing for about three months. And eventually, dental records confirmed this. This skeleton was Margaret. And clearly, she had been dead and her body had been in this location for a while, probably since her disappearance. For months, her body had just lay undiscovered. And unfortunately, because she was so decomposed, a cause of death could not be determined but it is stated on one source that quote signs of torture were visible on her remains it was clear that this was yet another homicide and as you've probably guessed the police believed that Margaret was another victim of Stephen Pennell's so that made four women four women that is believed he had murdered however sadly they weren't able to charge him with all four murders because of the fact that Margaret's body was so decomposed she had been exposed to the elements and that meant that there wasn't actually any evidence, concrete evidence, to link Stephen to her case and so for that reason he couldn't be charged with her murder. He was only charged with three murders, the murders of Shirley Ellis, Catherine DeMauro and Michelle Gordon. His trial began in September of 1989. He pleaded not guilty, he was still maintaining his innocence but I mean as we know the evidence against him was pretty overwhelming. The evidence was presented to the jury by the prosecution and interestingly Stephen himself actually took the witness stand during the trial which did not do him any favours when it came to the jury because apparently when he was talking about the victims in the case, the women, he was just vile. He was so rude and disrespectful. I have a quote here from the state attorney, prosecutor Kathleen Jennings, and she said, the way he described DeMauro was so cold. He talked about her like she was some piece of garbage he could just throw away. I think that hurt him in front of the jury. And she was right, it did hurt his case because at the end of his trial, he was found guilty. But not of all three murders. Stephen Pennell was actually only convicted of the first two, the killings of Shirley and Catherine. When it came to Michelle Gordon, the jury could not reach a verdict. They didn't believe that there was enough evidence to convict him of Michelle's murder, which kind of baffles me, considering the fact that one of her hairs was found in his van. But I think perhaps them not reaching a verdict could have possibly been due to the fact that if you remember technically Michelle died because the drugs in her system meant that her heart couldn't withstand the torture that her attacker subjected her to. So because she didn't have the same cause of death as the first two women, you know, she wasn't strangled or hit in the head, the jury weren't 100% sure whether or not she was killed by the same man. So he was unfortunately acquitted of Michelle's murder, but for the deaths of Shirley Ellis and Catherine DeMauro, he was handed two life sentences and with that 
he was sent away to prison. And I actually read on one source that after he was sentenced, the lead prosecutor in this case, Kathleen Jennings, she received a huge bouquet of flowers and a note attached to it which read, quote, you made us feel human again from the women of Route 40. Now that is not where this case ends, far from it actually, because even after Pennell was sent to prison, the police did not close the case. You see, they believed that he was responsible for the murder of yet another missing woman, a woman named Kathleen Meyer. She was 26 years old and she vanished on the 23rd of September 1988, so she would have been victim number five. Now sadly, Kathleen's body was never found and I don't believe she has ever been found to this day, but the reason the police know that Pennell was responsible for her disappearance was because Kathleen was last seen on Route 40 as she was getting into a blue Ford van. Now a police officer actually saw this. They saw her getting into the van that night and so they jotted down the license plate of the vehicle and this led them back to Stephen Pennell. It was his van that Kathleen got into on the day that she went missing. But that wasn't all. After Pennell was convicted of two of the murders, forensics actually detected traces of Kathleen's blood in his blue van, which again proved that she had been in there and that she had most likely been killed in there. So even though they didn't have her body, they felt that that was enough to charge him and take him to trial again for Kathleen's murder and so that's exactly what they set out to do. But as it would turn out, Stephen would never have a full-on trial like the first time around because this time he decided to actually confess. He confessed to Kathleen's murder. He admitted that he killed her, and not just her, but also Michelle Gordon, the third victim, the case that he was originally acquitted of. He admitted to her murder too, and he actually asked if he could do the next lot of court proceedings without a lawyer because he wanted to represent himself. Apparently he said that part of the reason why he confessed was because he didn't want to put his own family through a second trial. And whilst he was representing himself, he requested that the judge sentenced him to death. He actually referred to himself in the third person and said that whoever did this, whoever committed these heinous crimes, should be put to death themselves. They should be executed. He should be executed. It's believed that he did this. He asked for the death penalty because it was his way of still trying to have some of the control, to have some control over what would happen to him. And his request was accepted. On the 31st of October 1991, Pennell was given the death penalty. And less than five months later, his execution date arrived. Stephen Pennell was put to death by lethal injection on the 14th of March 1992. And his death marked the first execution in the state of Delaware for 46 years. I'm not gonna lie, I have very mixed feelings about the fact that he was executed because I mean clearly that's what he wanted. He didn't want to sit in prison forever. He wanted the death penalty. He requested that and I don't know how to feel about the fact that his request was granted so quickly. I kind of wish that he spent years and years and years behind bars before his execution date like many other death row prisoners do because he essentially got to choose his fate. He got to choose when he died. And why should he have the right to do that when he stole the lives of so many women? They didn't get to choose. They didn't get to decide what the future would look like for them. So why should he have that privilege? But yeah, anyway, he was executed in March of 1992. And that concludes this case. That is the case of the Route 40 serial killer, Stephen Pennell. He was ultimately convicted of four murders, but it is believed by the majority of people that he committed five. The only murder that he wasn't convicted of was Margaret Lynn Finner because, as I said earlier, there just was not a substantial amount of evidence to prove it, which is so awful for Margaret's loved ones, the fact that she was she was the only victim who never received justice. Please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments. As always, I would love to hear what you guys have to say and also feel free to let me know in the comments of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. 
all. Before I go, a quick thank you once again to Anna Luisa for sponsoring and a reminder that you can click the link in the description box to access their Valentine's Day sale. When you buy one, you'll get the second half price, a 50% discount when you buy two pieces. Or if you're seeing this after Valentine's Day, use the code MOLLY20 to get 20% off your order. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!